So in the last lecture, we talked about how sound is being produced and um, how it propagates through a medium. But sound is but a mechanical wave that propagates as pressure fluctuations in a medium, uh, namely, uh, most likely it's an air medium. And if some conditions are met, um, be, um, uh, namely, if it falls within the operating limits of our auditory system, we hear that as an auditory experience or an auditory sensation. But basically, there are two types of waves, uh, a transverse wave and a longitudinal wave. The main difference between a transverse wave and a longitudinal wave um, is uh, the relationship between the direction of with which the particles are being displaced uh, in relation to the direction in which the wave is being propagated. So in this instance, the particles of the medium are dis being displaced up and down while the wave is actually propagating from left to right. We can create a simple transverse wave by uh, using a, a skipping rope or, uh, or a string. And of course, um, all of you will probably have an experience creating a wave in a stadium, um, probably when there was a touchdown, um, touchdown since it's football season now. So when you're creating a wave, essentially uh, people in a row um, stand up and down um, sequentially, um, and you create a wave along the row. One point uh, that's important is each person uh, just is being displaced uh, in his own plane. So he just stands up and down, um, and um, the adjacent person does the same, uh, and so on, uh, creating this wave. Such is the case for a transverse wave moving through a medium. Any individual particle is just is displaced around its place of rest, so it moves up and down for a single wave, uh, while the adjacent person um, uh, moves up and down. So the particle itself doesn't move along the direction of the wave, uh, but it just moves in its own plane. And that is the case for a sound wave also. So um, if you were in a classroom and if I was speaking, um, I'm creating pressure fluctuations in, of the air particles right in front of my uh, lips. In turn, those particles displace the particles in front of them and so on till it, that pressure fluctuation, that, um, that force uh, that's being displaced reaches those particles close to your ears, um, stimulating your eardrum and then resulting in an auditory sensation. In a longitudinal wave, the particles are displaced in the same direction with, as the wave direction. So that would be an example of, of a wave created in a slinky. Um, so uh, when a wave is created, those the strands are the strings of a string uh, of a slinky. Um, they come together in areas of compression, like over here. And then there's areas of rarefaction where they come apart, and then they come together again, so thereby creating areas of high pressure and low pressure. So consider this as an open tube, um, and here's a membrane, um, like the membrane of a drum. Uh, and when you stimulate that membrane, it displaces those air particles in front of them um, and it's this displacement or pressure fluctuation that moves along the length of the tube. So here you can see individual particles, uh, the ones in red. So you can see that they are being displaced, in this case left and right, um, in the same direction as the wave is moving along the length of the tube. So this is an example of a longitudinal wave. Longitudinal wave, the particles are displaced in the same direction as the wave motion. I've got some hyperlinks over here that uh, will take you to some websites 
that uh, can supplement the information that we just talked about. Sound waves traveling through a solid medium can either travel in a transverse fashion or in a longitudinal fashion. For example, the wave that you create with a slinky, you can make the slinky move uh, in a transverse fashion, um, or you can um, result in, uh, you can make the slinky move in a longitudinal fashion. But tra waves traveling through a more rarefied medium like liquid or gas always moves in a longitudinal fashion. Because a classical example of a longitudinal wave would be a sound wave. Yeah. So again, if you use a tuning fork and if you stimulate the tuning fork uh, in front of a tube, open tube uh, like this one, the air particles are going to be um, creating pressure fluctuations. So with areas of high pressure, namely compressions, and followed by areas of low pressure, namely rarefactions. And it's just compressions and rarefactions that are um, that moving along the length of the tube um, as the wave propagates. So here is an animation of a string being displaced. So when it's at rest, those particles are separated by a certain distance. But when it's stimulated, it results in kind of resulting congestions of those particles, um, and then rarefactions where those particles are spread apart. And when this pressure fluctuations reaches, let's say, our tympanic membrane, a TM, um, it results in displacing the TM in the same pattern as uh, the vibrating membrane that resulted in that sound. And we hear that uh, as, uh, as a tone or as a sound. The simplest form of a wave would be a sine wave. Um, a sine waves have only one frequency in with, with which they vibrate. So here is an instance of a sine wave. Um, so again, you're seeing a longitudinal wave over here with areas of compression and rarefactions. Um, as you can see, it's kind of difficult to represent a longitudinal wave as it is. Um, and for simplicity purposes, um, we can represent a longitudinal wave in this fashion. Um, so deceivingly, it might look like a, a transverse wave. But here, you're representing a longitudinal wave on a pressure or amplitude or displacement axis uh, as your y-axis um, as a function of time uh, as your x-axis. So areas of compression of high or areas of high pressure are shown as a positive side of the uh, of this wave, and then areas of rarefaction are shown as a negative uh, cycle of this wave. So henceforth, we'll be using the simple waveform to represent sound, which actually travels in the form of a longitudinal wave. Okay. As I said, sine wave is the simplest form of uh, an oscillation uh, and the simplest form of a sound. For a single cycle of vibration or oscillation, uh, we begin at one point, resulting, um, and we'll have one area of, of high pressure or of positive deflection, and then one. half cycle of a rarefaction or reduced pressure. A sine wave is, is but a, a simple mathematical function uh, and represents a smooth oscillation, like the oscillation of a weight uh, being displaced on a spring or the movement of a tuning fork. When a body oscillates sinusoidally, uh, with only one frequency of vibration, we call that as a pure tone. Okay. Pure tones um, of different frequencies are used uh, in, an, on, in an audiological assessment. In fact, pure tone audiometry uh, remains the golden standard in audiological assessment. 
What we do in pure tonal geometry um, is we sample uh, a person's hearing at um, discrete frequencies. So namely, the frequencies can be 250 hertz, 500 hertz, 1000 hertz, 2000 hertz, uh, 4000 hertz, and 8000 hertz. The idea is to, again, sample different parts of, discrete parts of the auditory system. And we know from, um, probably from last semester, uh, that one of the main principles of the auditory system is this concept known as tonotopicity. Tonotopicity refers to the frequency representation um, in pretty much all the principal structures in the auditory system. For instance, in the cochlea, in, within the inner ear, frequency is, is represented such that um, the higher frequencies uh, stimulate the basal end um, of the cochlea, while the lower frequencies stimulate the apical end at the top of the cochlea. And frequencies that fall between those ranges um, sequentially or systematically stimulate uh, the length of the basilar membrane. So in pure tone audiometry, when we're testing low frequencies, mid frequencies, and high frequencies, we are sampling uh, the apical, the middle part of the cochlea, and the basal part of the cochlea. And we're going to be having exercises in pure tone audiometry. Um, both online and um, with the software that uh, we'll be working on. So in pure tones, um, we have only one frequency of vibration. Uh, so this frequency um, is, repeats itself as a constant number of cycles per second. Um, some sounds around us um, might sound like pure tones. Um, examples would be like a whistle, or the sound made by a tuning fork, or the sound made when you're moving your finger, a wet finger, over the rim of a glass. Pure tones are heard as clear signals by the auditory system um, because they're well, they're simple and they have only one frequency of vibration. So here is an illustration of a tuning fork resulting in pressure fluctuations as concentric circles around the tuning fork. So when the tuning fork throngs are displaced when it's stimulated, it results in areas of high pressure and low pressure and so on. Uh, and the cycle repeats itself in a constant fashion. Uh, because it moves in only one frequency. So when you're talking about vibration, there's uh, two main types of vibration. We've got free vibration and forced vibration. When you set a tuning fork to vibrate, um, it's going to result in a pure tone. Um, and if you have only one stimulation, um, Eventually, the sound is going to die out. Okay. The sound created by a tuning fork with only one stimulation is what we call as a free vibration. However, the total time in which the sound is sustained depends upon the amount of damping in the medium. Over time, the sound is going to um, die out. And that's because of the friction caused by those air particles in the medium that results in removing energy in the form of thermal energy or heat. And eventually, uh, the sound uh, flattens out or dies out. In a forced vibration, as long as if you provide an external force, uh, you'll be able to sustain that vibration. But now, the external force might affect the way in which this particle oscillates or vibrates, and that's something that we're going to be talking about in a bit. Damping refers to um, how much energy is being lost uh, because of friction. Different mediums have different amounts of damping. Um, 
particles that are more dense, like solids, have more damping uh, than, say, liquids or air. Um, and you probably might have seen dampers all around you, um, like dampers um, used in automobiles, um, where if you go over a speed bump, um, your your car um, doesn't bob up and down perpetually or well, forever. Well, although some people might like that. Um, and dampers are also um, within a, any good room. We have carpets where dampen the sound. They observe uh, the low frequency sounds um, so it doesn't um, result in vibrating um, or reverberating within the room. Here you see an example of uh, an old classic clocks. In the earlier days when they made clocks, uh, they had pendulums that oscillated at a set time um, and thereby moving uh, the hands of the clock. Uh, but eventually these pendulums are going to lose energy and if they're not provided an external force, they're going to die out, uh, thereby you're going to lose time. The only way we can prevent or control damping is uh, making oscillations within a vacuum. Um, in vacuum, the particles um, do not lose energy when they are oscillating. And the reason why, uh, if you are pushed in space, uh, where which is surrounded by vacuum, uh, you can go on forever. However, in air um, around the Earth, you are going to have uh, damping because of air particles losing energy, uh, colliding with each other in the form of thermal energy or heat. So in earlier days, they actually had a vacuum chamber where the pendulum were, was oscillating, uh, thereby reducing the amounts of uh, friction and damping. However, uh, maintaining a vacuum chamber is a very expensive affair. Um, so in modern day clocks, we have a motor or a spring mechanism, which actually uh, constantly um, feeds energy into the pendulum, thereby sustaining the movement. So waves differ uh, by a number of different aspects. Namely, they can differ by the amplitude in which the particles are being displaced. Um, and typically, amplitude is represented in the y-axis um, of a waveform. They can differ in terms of the time taken um, for each cycle or the number of times um, a cycle repeats itself within a certain time frame, namely frequency. Or they can dip uh, differ in terms of phase. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit of, in more detail about each of those aspects. Frequency refers to how often an, an event repeats itself within a certain uh, time. So when you're calculating the frequency of an event, you're pretty much calculating uh, the number of times that event happens within a fixed time frame. So if, let's say if, you're, uh, if the bus shuttle at ETSU stops for um, three times every hour, so that would be considered the frequency um, of, the, the, of the shuttle. Now in sound, we're talking about occurrences that happen very frequently. So the time scale we use uh, is quite small. Um, and um, So we use seconds. So the number of times a cycle repeats itself within a second would be the frequency of that sound. And the unit we use for cycles per second is hertz. So here, when you're looking at a waveform, um, the number of cycles that happen within a certain time frame would be the frequency of that um, sound or that um, displacement. Always, when you're looking at a waveform, um, make a note of its axis. So here, in a waveform, the axis is uh, the x-axis is time, um, which would typically in seconds are milliseconds. Um, 
um, and the y-axis is pressure or amplitude. Related to frequency is the concept of a period. Now, period refers to the time taken for one cycle of vibration. Um, and the units for period are seconds or milliseconds. Now, period and frequency have an inverse relationship. Uh, namely, for sounds that have higher frequencies, uh, the period is small. And frequencies um, that are low have longer periods. So here you can see higher frequency sound. Um, the duration for each cycle is going to be short with relationship to a low frequency sound where the duration of each cycle is longer. So the period refers to the duration of each cycle of the wave, while frequency refers to the number of cycles within a certain time frame. So the period refers to the time with which it takes to do something, um, while frequency refers to how often that happens. So let's just calculate the period of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So that would be 365 days and a quarter, while the period of the minutes hand on a clock would be 60 minutes. So frequency refers to how often something happens, while period refers to the time it ta takes for uh, one single event. So frequency is a rate quantity, uh, while period is a time quantity. We use cycles per second to calculate the frequency, while period is calculated by the number of seconds uh, uh, for each cycle. There's a number of factors um, that affect frequency, namely the physical properties of the sound that of the object that creates its sound, namely length, mass, and stiffness. Now, length. Objects that are longer um, result in producing a low frequency sound. For instance, look at the um, strings of a harp or your guitar. Strings that are longer result in a low frequency note, while strings that are shorter result in a high pitch or a high frequency note. So frequency has an inverse relationship to the length. And the exact relationship is that it's, uh, it's proportional to 1 over the square root of the length. Mass. Mass has a similar relationship to frequency as length does. Now, an object that has a larger mass results in um, vibrating slower or vibrating with a lower frequency. Um, again, objects with a smaller mass result in, uh, in a higher pitch or a higher frequency sound. And again, an, an example of that would be the mass of the strings of a guitar. You will notice that some strings of the guitar have, are more thicker, uh, they have a, low, a higher mass, while some strings are more thinner, they have lower mass. The strings that have a higher mass result in a lower note, so they vibrate at a lower frequency, while strings that have a smaller mass vibrate at a higher frequency, resulting in a higher note. The third physical property that affects frequency is stiffness. Now, stiffness has a direct relationship to frequency. In other words, objects that are stiffer or have an increased stiffness result in vibrating at a higher frequency, resulting in a higher note, while objects that have a lower stiffness um, result in vibrating at a, a lower frequency. Again, you can take the example of the strings of the guitar. Now, you can make the strings of the guitar more tart or stiffer. And you notice that more stiffer the string becomes, higher the frequency or the higher the tone or the higher the pitch it makes. Um, 
So frequency has a direct relationship to the square root of stiffness. Okay, here are some links that will take you to animations um, where you can actually interactively change the stiffness and you can note how um, the frequency in which it vibrates and uh, the, the tone it creates. Here is a link that talks about how stiffness um, is actually um, actually results in the frequency representation along the basilar membrane within the cochlea. Now there's different ways in which we can depict or look at um, sound. Um, the simplest wave um, would be like as a spectrum. In a spectrum, um, we look at the frequency composition of sounds, especially, and it's it's a good tool to look at sounds that are more complex in nature, where they have a number of frequencies of different amplitudes. So far, we have looked at sound in the form of waveforms, and this is what we call as 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 a representation within the time domain. Okay, so this is a waveform where we're so showing a simple sine wave as a function of amplitude or intensity or pressure on your y-axis um, over time. And it's a good way of looking at simple sounds uh, that have only one or just a few frequencies. The spectrum is a better way of looking at uh, sounds that are more complex in nature that have a number of frequencies. So in a spectrum, you're looking at frequency on your x-axis and the intensity on your y-axis. And this is an example of a complex periodic sound, um, the spectrum of a complex periodic sound. So here you're seeing it has a number of frequencies and there's a certain relationship um, of the amplitude of those different frequencies. Now what we lose when we're looking at a spectrum is uh, the time relationship. So we're looking at frequency and versus amplitude in a spectrum, but it doesn't show uh, the, the time, uh, which might be an important uh, feature to look at for uh, a time varying signal like speech, which is also a complex signal. A good way of looking at speech sounds would be in the form of spectrograms. In spectrograms, you're looking at um, frequency in your y-axis as a function of time in your x-axis. Spectrograms also represent amplitude. They're shown by the darkness of the trace. So here, um, you're seeing a spectrum of a sentence. Um, so you're seeing that um, it, it's a complex signal uh, with a number of frequencies. Are represented over here, but some of uh, some portions of the spectrum are darker. Uh, that means that there's higher amplitude, um, while some areas are uh, li uh, lighter, and that would mean that these frequencies have a lower amplitude. And again, you're seeing those relationship as a function of time. <laughs> 